Hello and welcome to this, our latest uh, Leaders Insight session for Automotive EV. Uh, I'm Sean Hunter, Content Director for Automotive EV. For this session, I'm going to be handing you over to the uh, uh, very uh, astute Parham Antonio Vasili from Aptiv, who will be taking you through the session, along with Chris Tamjidi from Awaris. And the discussion will be on growth and innovation through mindful leadership. Uh, looking forward to the session. Thank you, Parham. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. I'm uh, very, very excited today, um, not only to talk about uh, one of my um, favorite subjects, um, leadership, uh, the mindset of a leader, and the mindfulness, but also to be here with uh, Chris Tamjidi, um, a very good friend of mine, and for many years, uh, really a, a mentor for me when it comes to leadership and mindset. So, uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Nice to see you here, and hello to everybody seen and unseen yes we are a little bit in uh, in of course uh, uh, challenging times at the moment and this is why i thought it's even more important to support this event with a, a leadership's inside stream and mm -hmm. also looking at the mental health at the resilience of the employees and the leaders now when we talk about mm -hmm. mental health we talk about resilience um we we tend to of course think a lot about um, the the mostly um, uh, challenging aspect uh, associated with this terminology, thinking about perceived stress, thinking about the challenges coming from um, uh, the work we have to do and the time pressures. But actually, there is also a very, very um, growth-oriented positive side to the whole story, which is mm -hmm. really allowing employees and leaders to flourish, get the right mental and cognitive capabilities to be more innovative, more creative, to, to enhance um, our, our willingness and openness to be more diverse in our teams and in our organizations, mm -hmm. and ultimately um, uh, delivering success for both our customers and the shareholders and, and uh, all the stakeholders in our organization. That's why I'm very excited that Chris will today talk with us about growth and innovations through mindful leadership and the mindset we got to adopt. And Chris, I would, would like to hand over to you um, for a short introduction about yourself, but, but talk us a little bit through what does that actually mean and, and what is the secret ingredients um, which allows organizations to, to grow and be more innovative and maintain that sustainably over time. Thanks, Param. So, yeah, I mean, I think just in terms of introductions to myself, I think it's useful to say, you know, I studied physics, so I tend to be very kind of empirical and very evidence-based in looking at this topic. So, you know, and I find that there's a lot of hot air around these things, but actually there's also a lot of substance. And I think that's very important, especially at this time, to really look at the kind of evidence. So, you know, after my studies of physics, I did an MBA. I worked for the Boston Consulting Group for seven years. And I work primarily in the automotive sector. So I feel, you know, for, for me, it's a very familiar sector. I, you know, I have done work in plants. I've done work in new product development. I did a lot of the globalization strategies for some of the big automotive companies. So, you know, I think I have a fair sense of, you know, the business and so on. And, uh, and then I stepped out and, you know, for the last 12 years now, I've been working on the intersection between mindfulness, neuroscience and leadership. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, especially in these times, you know, when there's such a, you could say, focus on task effectiveness, on, you know, kind of, you know, us, even us now, you know, here we are on our screens, you know, talking about things. I think there's a danger that we miss some of the things which actually ensure that people function well and that actually ensure that organizations function well, okay? And, you know, I think that, the, you know, I guess my very deep sense of, connection to this comes from my work with a Formula One team. I've been working for the last five years with a Formula One team, which wins a lot. Uh, I think everyone can you know, guess perhaps who they may be. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, they're very explicit about, for them, the inseparability of performance and care. You cannot maintain high performance if you do not take care of yourself, if you do not take care of each other. You know, and things like psychological safety. So that's what I want to get into. And what I'll do is I'll just share a few pieces of data around that, okay? And please, you know, Parham, you know me, just feel free to interrupt, ask any questions, uh, you know, if you think that's kind of the right time to ask. Okay, so, okay, so um, just short thumbs up from you, Parham, do you see that? Okay, super. So, you know, I think that this is a starting point. Like I said, I'm, I like to be evidence-based. People talk a lot about stress and all these kind of things, but actually what is stress when we look at it, okay? And one way of actually assessing stress 
is to look at the activation of our nervous systems, okay? When there is a trigger, like, you know, Parham, if I were to take this pen and I were to throw it at you, okay? <laughs> you know, I would activate something within you that you could react quickly, okay? And that's what's called the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which is here indicated in red on this chart, okay? And then, you know, when you're in recovery mode, do you actually have the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which, you know, kind of regenerates, heals, and so on, okay? And this is data from what are called HRV monitors, heart rate variability monitors. So they measure the variability in heart rates of people. I've equipped lots of people with these for days at a time. So for example, with this Formula One team, we've done this. I've worked with a lot of people involved in diesel problems at some of the German automotive companies. You know, and I think this is the pattern you see with a lot of people. You see a lot of people spend most of their time in the red, okay? And very little of their time in recovery. And the interesting thing is, when we think about sports people, we know as a sports person that actually performance comes from the balance between activation and recovery, okay? And this is actually the same thing in any kind of knowledge work, okay? So when you are in this active zone for too long, you see a significant decline in performance, okay? And this is very measurable nowadays. And I think that this is kind of what I think is such a shame, especially as we go into this period, which is this very strange period we're in, where many people are finding that they actually are not taking care of themselves very well. You know, they're stuck in front of screens, whereas before they might have had a break between meetings, they don't have breaks anymore. So there's a danger there that people will not take care of themselves. And this has a big impact on the individual level, and it has a big impact, and this is the next thing, on the collective level, okay? So again, when you look at the evidence on what drives the performance of teams, Okay. And the evidence is overwhelming. Once you get the basics of the theme right in terms of, you know, roles are done and that kind of stuff, the overwhelming evidence is that it's actually psychological safety or social inclusion or trust. You know, different studies come up with a different terminology for it, but fundamentally it's the same thing. It's a sense of this connectiveness to us, okay? And this is something which, you know, especially in this time now, one has to be very careful about because, you know, in our focus on task effectiveness, in our screen focus, we forget all the invisible things that actually connect us as humans and make us function. Okay, so this is, I think, one of the dangers we have to talk about in terms of resilience. Okay, that yes, most of our organizations have reestablished effectiveness, plain effectiveness on the, you know, development level on people getting their stuff done. But actually, there's a real danger that the quality of collaboration and the quality of, you could say, the glue that holds an organization together will decline okay, over time. And I'm seeing this with organizations that after this initial upsurge in kind of interconnection, checking how people are, it's like, okay, now the next six months, we're getting back to business. Okay, So this is the second aspect. So there's the individual aspect of resilience, people taking care of themselves and the strong impact that has on cognitive function, on collaborative function. The more stressed people are, the less collaborative they are. There is the aspect of taking care of the whole at the team level. And then this is something which I found, you know, kind of almost funny, to be honest. Like I said, I've worked a lot in car companies. And one story which really struck me was I worked with the development teams, you know, uh, engine development teams at another car company. And, you know, I, I, we, asked, we were talking about emotions in teamwork and they were, have, you know, they were facing difficult issues. And I said to them, you know, what percentage of your time is lost because of emotional challenges in the team? The number of teams, you know, had problems. And they said, really, a whole bunch of German leaders said 30 to 50% of our time is lost because of emotional friction. And I said, okay, uh, for how long has this been going on for? And they said, oh, about a year and a half. I said, you know, if you had a engineering issue, which would cost you 30 to 50% of your capacity, how long would it take till that's solved? And they were like, you know, within two months or whatever. And then I said, if this issue has been going on for a year and a half, since when have you been talking about it? Today is the first time we talked about it in this way. Okay. And this is what I mean about this blind blindness. We spend a lot of time also at the organizational level trying to fix the gears, the processes, the, the you know, the structures, whatever it is, the technology and so on. That's all important. But if you do not take care of the oil, your gears will grind up, okay? And this is the third aspect of resilience, the organizational resilience. 
you know, you cannot just pay attention to risk and so on. You need to pay attention to the basic fabric of people's connectedness to each other, their enjoyment of what they do, their appreciation, their sense of perspective, their sense of purpose, okay? That's, you could say, the oil in the gears. And so these are the three aspects, okay, that we need to think about in this time. And, you know, that's essentially where, I guess, mindfulness plays a big role. So I don't know if we can pause here if you want for a few questions or... Yeah, I think um, interesting and have you mentioned, you know, the, the, the kind of how in the in the social um, environment with an organization you have to function. I have this example where we've been um, appointing a large group of um, architects, very complex role where you really have to kind of listen to each other. You have to understand the requirements from different disciplines. It's cross-functional, it's multidisciplinary. And we brought this group of architects together in total 15 people, very, very smart people across the company. And uh, they also were introduced to a new area, which we, was the system design area, great screens, whiteboards, everything was kind of perfectly set up for that. After a week, we found out that they all went back to the home departments and uh, they all uh, were not really collaborating in the sense we wanted them to collaborate. And after engaging, speaking with them, we found out that listening to each other and, and making sure they not only listen to respond, but listen to then comprehend, process the information and come up with a complex system design, which is satisfying the requirements of somebody from a different department, actually takes a lot and lot of energy. And in the end, the, the guys were very fragmented in the heads and, and, and had a lot of complexity comprehending each other's requirements. So, Giving them these tools, you know, the, the ability or the right tools and the right mindset really then help them also to unlock this situation. So I think it's a really good example to say it's this the social well-being, bringing people together, then also increases obviously the output because the output of our current problems we are facing in the automotive industry, they're not just individual components, but it's about the large scale interconnected complex system. Um, you know, this is what we always have to remind ourselves. Okay, and you know, you and I have worked together on the topic of systems intelligence. And when you break down what is the systems intelligence, well, that has a lot to do with people's ability to be present, to be empathic, to listen well, as you know, to integrate the opinions of others. Because that's, you know, if you remember, we looked at the study of what the kind of top systems engineers worldwide, what their qualities were. And their qualities were all actually, you know, this is very technical. This was done by NASA, if you remember that study. And it was all the qualities were empathy or openness. And the thing is, you don't get empathy if you're totally burned out. You know, you're not going to be an empathic individual if you've been in the red for the last six months. Do you see what I mean? And I think that this, you know, whenever I say this, everyone kind of nods, you know, you're right, Chris, you know, everyone agrees on this. But it's a little bit like the topic of quality, you know, we can agree upon it. But if we just agree upon it, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> okay. You do need to look at the causality as you do with quality process and begin to understand where does the causality start. And the causality starts at the individual, the individual's ability to manage their attention, their presence, their empathy. And many of us are so focused outwards, we have no idea where the inner buttons are <laughs> about how do we manage our attention? How do we manage our emotional state? You know, the, and that's where I find, you know, people in the automotive industry are often extremely intelligent about complex, complex things on external. But actually, when it comes to their internal processes, there's actually a lot of blindness. It's a shame. Um, let's maybe have a look at, at some of the some of the areas of leadership. I mean, what do you see as now the key challenges for leaders in, in such a fragmented and ambiguous and, and complex environment as we're living in at the moment in automotive? Where do you think uh, are leaders being challenged? Well, I mean, I think, that, you know, there's many ways of looking at this. One way that I think it's helpful for us in our discussion to look at this, and this is not the only way, is that essentially there is a danger whenever you get too fixated on the problem A, the problem B, the problem C. We know it. Whenever you have stress, your perception narrows. Okay, that's There's good evolutionary reasons for that. Okay, And the interesting thing is the whole Zoom and MS Teams world also narrows our perception. Okay, Because as I'm sitting here, I'm looking at a screen and I'm trying to read Parham's emotional state by looking you know, in detail at my screen. Do you know what I mean? So actually, there's a real big danger that my attention is being overused. Okay, And people think this is great. They feel effective. But they don't realize that actually their awareness is being underused. Okay. These are distinct aspects of how we attend to reality. These are distinct aspects about how we perceive and how we learn, okay? So both when we have problems, we tend to overuse attention, 
as well as when we are in this kind of virtual world. And we underuse awareness. And awareness is that which integrates complexity. It actually leads to it's an underlying, you could say, process of emotional intelligence, of systems intelligence. So I think especially now, where there's an extremely high tendency to just be task focused, effectiveness focused, narrow focus because of stress. And, and all these things are important. I'm not saying, I mean, you know what it is. I'm not saying don't do that. It's like saying, you know, don't be intelligent. Of course you should be intelligent. But of course the question is how do you balance that with a broader awareness, with a broader perspective? And I think there you really are, at the moment people are being pulled in a certain direction and they often have no mechanisms by which they can pull themselves back from that direction. Okay, They just feel, I have to, I have to, I have to, because, because, because. And they lose the perspective of the way, actually, if I don't take care of myself, then my perception will get narrow. And I'll believe all that. I just recently, actually, I worked with the CEO of one company, and we did some practices together. And, you know, at the end of this, I said to him, well, I, you know, how, how do you see things now? He says, well, actually, it's interesting, Chris. I, you know, I feel completely different about the problems that I just told you about 10 minutes ago. I said, oh, interesting. So your state of mind and your stress level affects your perception of these problems. And he was like, yeah, you're right. And I was like, just take a moment to think about that. Your whole perception of reality is deeply affected by your nervous system. And that's, you know, that's kind of a no brainer, but everyone agrees to that, but they don't take the consequence seriously. The consequence is therefore I need to manage my nervous system because my nervous system affects my perception of reality. Okay. So I've worked, for example, with the European commission a lot on, you know, the politics in Europe. Okay. And politics in Europe is a real issue that people essentially, you're seeing that people are becoming viscerally more nervous in society and therefore how they're relating to information, how they're relating to political processes is changing, do you see? And unless we actually address the nervousness of the individual, you, know, you can't change the way people function if they don't know how to regulate their nervous state. So I think that this is kind of, you know, this really important shift that people, you know, will create a further high tension, high fixation, high speed reality if they don't actually learn to regulate their own inner processes. Yeah, that's a good point. One term which yeah, Parm is gone. <laughs> okay, so Parm is gone. What I'll do is I'll just share my screen. I have one more, two more slides that I wanted to share, and we'll see whether he'll come back or not. Okay, so let me just go back to this. Okay, so you know I think what I was saying about is that fundamentally, any of you that are out there, do, for example, doing sports, okay. When you do sports, you cultivate flexibility of the body. You cultivate, you know, your your cardiovascular fitness. You cultivate power, for example, okay, depending on what you're doing, okay? And I think this is the challenge that actually when you look at what you need as a leader, you need to have core inner skills, okay? If you don't know how to regulate your nervous system, you will always be a victim of your nervous state, okay? And that's, a, frankly, I'm sorry to say this. A lot of people are in highly nervous states and actually are tense the whole time. They think that's called effectiveness, <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's the case, okay? So when we learn to practice these skills connected to things like mindfulness or other, whatever other practices they are, we can actually learn to regulate that, okay? And core skills we learn to do is we learn to actually relax, okay? Now, sometimes I say to very senior people, you need to relax, and they look at me like as if I'm some complete idiot. They say, you know, Chris, you don't have a clue about the world I live in, okay? How can you tell me to relax? And I'm saying, I'm sorry. You still have to relax. Any performance athlete knows they have to learn to balance relaxation and recovery. If you don't know how to relax, then you feel you can't do it and therefore you push it away. But actually, the better you are at relaxing, then you'll be able to relax within two minutes in a meeting, refresh yourself and be present for the next thing. Okay. So, you know, it's not about kind of relaxing and just kind of putting your feet up. It's about having a skill of relaxing. Okay. Once we relax better, we're actually better able to feel present embodied and this is very important in this time that people feel embodied that they're connected to their body because it's actually is what emotional intelligence is, is very much connected to feeling embodied also is very important for us to notice more we become more aware and we're actually able to attend better we're able to direct our attention in a more either focused manner or in a wider scope depending on what the issues are at hand okay and, and based upon that, of course, we are also able to regulate our emotional state better, which includes also paying attention to the positive. Okay? So this is one of the dangers in today's age is 
we just focus on the urgent, the critical, the negative, and therefore our whole perception is filled with negativity, with the things that are problems. And this is especially the more senior a leader is, the more that happens to them. Because, you know, a leader doesn't get told what went well today. The leader basically gets told all of the problems that exist. Okay. So, you know, this is really a skill that we need to learn to filter. Okay. So especially again, if I say to engineers, you know, you need to be more positive. They kind of look at me like, you know, what kind of idiot are you? positivity you know how does that work okay when is that's very unrealistic and then i show them the data i say actually it's not true okay you're the ones who are unrealistic by continually focusing on the negative by filling your window of perception only with problems you think life and things are worse than they are okay if you look back upon the successes you've had okay so rather than just focusing on the problem at hand if you just take a moment to pause and actually We've solved, you know, solved 622 problems in the last three weeks or in the last whatever, six months. We could actually be proud and we could actually relax a little bit and we could actually have appreciation for each other. Okay. So these are things where I, you know, I really push back and say, look, here's the data. People are far more negative than they should be. Of course, as an engineer, you can't just be, you know, positive and airy fairy. Ah, don't worry about that feature. If there's a problem, <laughs> we'll fix it later. Of course, you can't do that. Okay. But fundamentally, being highly negative is actually not accurate in terms of the perception of reality. It's very important to cultivate this ability to be positive too, okay? and to pay attention to the positive. Okay. So, you know, and then finally, just, you know, based upon that, you can also learn to be much more empathic. Okay. And this again is very important in today's age. Okay. Because while many people talk about the high degree of interconnection we have in these virtual seminars, Zoom, MS Teams or whatever we're doing or, you know, WebEx or so on, we actually have an empathic dis disconnect, okay? So while we can communicate and we have a kind of cognitive connect, we don't feel each other. We don't know what the other person is feeling. We have, and we therefore have difficulty connecting to our teams in that way, okay? So this is actually also very important that you really kind of are aware of how you feel, where you are in presence and are therefore also better able to connect, okay? And so I think that these are the, so when you look at, and so one of the words that Parham mentioned at the beginning is the topic of mindful leadership. These are actually neurophysiologically measurable skills. So the things that I put on here are not kind of fluff stuff. We've measured all this. This is actually cultivatable. As a human being, you can cultivate these qualities. They can also be measured in you. And essentially it's like, you know, trying to play football at the level of Barcelona. If you don't have a high degree of passing accuracy, if you don't have a ability to whatever run at a certain speed, you know, it's not going to work. And I think that's the same thing in today's age. If you don't have some of these skills at a very basic human level, it's going to be a struggle. Okay. And I think that's kind of just to begin to, you know, round up our discussion is to say, what do we mean by mindful leadership is I think that there's a, you know, a situation nowadays where many people are very smart. You know, they're very good at looking at very complex things on their devices, you know, kind of figuring things out, okay? But, you know, their ability to actually be present, to be reflective, to just calm down, to be thoughtful, to be positive, and to be, actually be aware of what impact they're having on the wider system and not just fight for their territory, their component, their whatever their, you know, spec requirements are you know, is is causing problems, okay? You cannot have a higher level system outcome, okay? A benefit for the wider system if people do not take a bigger perspective, if people do not solve problems, if they do not reach out to each other. And I think that, you know, this is, you need to be able to actually be in a good state of mind, okay? So this is kind of very interesting to look at. There's a very strong connection between well-being and systems intelligence, okay? People who don't feel well, have great difficulty being empathic and being able to see the perspective of the other. And these are the things, interesting enough, when you look at the kind of qualities you need nowadays for collaborative, complex collaboration, systems intelligence, these are actually qualities. So that's why going back to, you know, essentially the, the point where I started from, you know, if we are not able to understand that performance and care are inseparable, okay, then actually it's, you know, it's going to be hard to function. And I think that that's kind of, we have to get away from this. I think especially, you know, again, if I may say, I'm sorry to perhaps say things that are maybe a little bit of not offensive, but, you know, challenging. You know, I do experience that, and I've worked a long time with the automotive industry, tends to be a little bit more perhaps macho, this idea of, well, if things are tough, then you have to tough it out, you know, or I had to tough it out. 
and uh, and I think nowadays it's just not a constructive approach, frankly. I think that mm -hmm. just toughing it out is not going to go anywhere. Resilience is not about toughing it out or about endurance. It is actually about recovery and about the sense of connection to people and the enjoyment of collaboration. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And of course, everybody has a uh, palm is back. Everybody has a different approach yeah. to it, right? Um, and I think uh, what you've been explaining is really what I call give give people the right mental and cognitive capabilities to really cope with the current situation. I mean, the automotive is going through a huge transformation. Not only the products, the, the hard requirements we're having, you know, more connected, autonomous, electric, the, the regulatory requirements, which to all which uh, push us, you know, to, to really rethink our strategies, but also the software requirements we're experiencing, right? Generation mm -hmm. Y, a totally yeah. different approach to, to engaging with, with organization. Things like urbanization, which is still a challenge. What, what does that actually mean? And now with the COVID-19 situation, which has, you know, not fundamentally changed these, but has kind of accelerated certain trends uh, going mm -hmm. forward. And, and I think something you m mentioned, um, which also resonates many years people said to me well you know you, you, you're responsible for the product development for the product you know software systems for autonomous and automated driving why do you care about this? and i think really if i'm not present in the moment then i'm not only wasting my time but i'm also wasting the time of my team and at the same time if i have an engineer or a manager on purpose doing the work they're doing not here in the moment really thinking about all potential opportunities then this is also counterproductive so i end up with errors in my requirement specification i end up with missed uh, uh, issues um, uh, from from a, from a testing and validation point of view so th there is a real business incentive to look at this and give people the right um, environment to flourish now we're approaching kind of the last two streets and i want to the audience a little bit also with a sense of okay so so what next so what what does the business leaders and organizational approach you um, uh, expect from you and what would be one or two recommendations you can give people to kind of follow up um, uh, after they have left this call well i mean i think there's two things first of all they should look at the evidence you know the evidence is out there performance and care are inseparable things like collaborative abilities are deeply connected to things like the well-beings of individuals. So the evidence is out there, they should look at it, okay? And then second of all, and this is kind of, you know, might sound strange, people often when I come into the room, they're like, oh, this is kind of guy with this esoteric stuff about inner regulation. And I say to them, actually, you know, you're the guys who are unrealistic. Honestly, you're the ones who are unrealistic. If you think that you can work in today's world without learning to regulate your inner states, without knowing how much your perception is affected by your internal stress state, okay? And if you think that just doing a, a session, like an hour session on this topic with me, is gonna change anything, then I'm sorry, you're just completely unrealistic, okay? If you look at what behavior change is, it's a little bit like quality. You need to understand the, the root causes, you need to begin to address the behavior, you need to establish rituals in the production environment, in the new product development environment, which actually are team-based rituals, which actually bring forth well-being, resilience, collaborative behavior. If you just think you're going to tell people that this is good and they should do it, it's completely unrealistic. And I think that kind of shocks them a little bit. And I say, you know, I say to them, look, wake up. I'm not the esoteric one. You're the esoteric ones here. But I think in the end, they accept it. And this is what we do with them. We just show them data. We always do assessments, whether it's HRV assessments, whether collective intelligence tests, you, you know, you know, we published with the Boston Consulting Group together on mindfulness and collective intelligence. Yeah. Okay. And the data is there, you know. So yeah. that's what I would recommend. That's, that's true. I think it's a very good paper indeed. And from my own experience as well, I think the data you come with, they have convinced a lot of uh, my, my own engineers and lead engineers on the subject too. So that's great. So also from my side, I really want to leave the audience with, with a, a note on, on, uh, on a positive note, really, really engage in this, um, try things out, read some papers. There is a lot on uh, the Harvard Business Review. There is these articles out with Chris together with BCG has written. So I'm uh, really looking forward uh, to some of your feedback. And I hope this was uh, engaging and interesting for you. So, Sean, back to you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, for me, very interesting. I've, I've, I've over the years been on a number of different uh, management leadership courses, and um, uh, this is something very different that I've not heard before. And so I'm definitely going to be reflecting on this. Uh, we've, we've got a question in um, from Kirsten Butcher. Uh, Paul, you're a very busy manager. <laughs> How do you integrate relaxation and mindfulness 
in your work time? And how is the reaction of your management team? Yeah, um, I think this is a very, very good question because a lot of people think in this subject that they have to basically, you know, drop a hand, drop a thing, you know, sit somewhere in the corner and, and, and meditate, which is which is really, really not the case, right? Because adopting a certain mindset using, you know, what I would call these mental and cognitive tools means that, that you will be in a position to respond in the moment. Of course, like every training, it doesn't come overnight. You can't do it half an hour, one hour, and then expect that you take it with you. For me, sometimes it just takes three to six seconds of, you know, this, this one or two breaths I take to make sure that the response I'm going to give to somebody or the email I'm going to press the send button on is, is being done, you know, consciously on purpose. Yeah, and I had many situations where, you know, somebody said something and I, and I was really furious about this, especially when somebody questions the, the engineering integrity of, of my teams. I get, you know, very emotional about this. But then this two, three, four, five, six seconds give me the opportunity to really reflect on what I want to do and respond accordingly. But at the same time, when I have to make difficult decisions, I have to make sure that first I... I go into myself and, and just spend a couple of se seconds with myself. If I go into one-to-one -one meetings, I usually practice just a little bit to make sure that I'm in the right space. Because again, for me as a leader, it's all about making sure that my time is for the people I'm serving. It's for the organization. And if, I, if I'm if i not at the right place at the right time with my mindset, then I'm not serving the organization, I'm not serving myself, and I'm not serving my people. So it all kind of clicks in. And then, like Chris said, it all becomes kind of non-esoteric because it becomes very specific, you know, KPI driven, performance driven. And at the same time, you really kind of spread this more or less positive um, and gross um, uh, mindset approach in the organization. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, both of you. Um, I, I, for one, could happily listen to you um, uh, carry on on this uh, for a little while yet, for sure. Uh, I'm sure it's been very beneficial to those that have tuned in as well. Uh, leadership insights, definitely. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much, Parham. Uh, we're back very shortly with our startup session. So until then, thank you, gentlemen. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.